much uh, for coming today. Uh, we're really excited that you guys are so excited about your program. Um, but today, me and Cheryl are mostly going to talk about just recycling. Um, we might touch on trash and we might touch on um, food waste and how to manage it, but focus is recycling. So um, we'll get started. So as I said before, my name is Emma McDonald, and I'm from the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, we work with sustainable materials management. Um, and if you want to move to the next slide. <laughs> um, so I'll start with the solid waste management hierarchy. So um, the solid waste management hierarchy sort of illustrates uh, the concept of trash reduction um, before we move on to recycling and then disposal. Um, so when we manage our waste, the cheapest thing that we can do, the most environmentally uh, responsible thing that we can do is prevent it from happening in the first place. Um, because when we manage our waste, uh, the processes that we use in order to manage it, they all take energy and they all cost money to do. So what we want to start with is waste prevention and reuse. And then we'll move on to recycling and composting. And then finally, we'll move on to WPE or uh, waste to energy facilities and then landfill disposal. Um, and you can move on. So as you all may or may not know, uh, in Connecticut, we are currently facing a waste crisis. So what this means is something that your first select woman alluded to. Uh, we currently um, are sending about a third of our waste out of state to landfills. Um, and this is because uh, last year in 2022, July, uh, the Mira incinerator in Hartford um, had to shut down. Um, and they burned about a third of Connecticut's municipal solid waste. So now that waste is being carted out of state. Um, and that costs more than it did for us to, I'll take questions, we'll take questions at the end. So hold on to them. Um, and so that leads to us paying more for the disposal of our garbage. Um, and so we're trying to avoid that. And we're trying to find different ways to reduce waste and uh, send it to different waste streams than out of state landfills. Um, and so one of the ways that we're attempting to do that is uh, the commissioner of East in conjun conjunction with municipalities across Connecticut um, created the Connecticut Coalition for Sustainable Materials Management in August of 2020. So if you can reach that slide. Um, the CCSMM, as the coalition is known, um, priorities include reducing the amount of waste that is generated in the state expanding reuse opportunities in Connecticut, increasing food scrap collection programs. So one of the ways that we're trying to do it is this pilot you guys are currently participating in. So great work. Um, we're also hoping to improve our recycling programs that already exist by reducing contamination and reducing municipal costs for disposal, um, which is helped by reducing contamination. Um, we're also hoping to implement new approaches, including pay as you throw, and EPR programs. Um, so pay as you throw is also known as unit-based pricing. And what this system is, is it treats trash like a utility. So um, we all pay an electricity bill um, every month. And our electricity bill is based off of how much electricity is used in that month. Currently, we pay for our garbage disposal through our taxes. Um, and so when you switch to this unit-based pricing system, um, it can save you money uh, because you can reduce the amount of trash you're producing that needs to go to disposal and um, you'll pay as you throw uh, instead of paying as your whole town throws. So that's how that program works. And then EPR is also known as Extended Producer Responsibility. Um, so what this program is, is a um, program where the manufacturer of products is responsible for the end of life of those products. So um, we have a few EPR programs in the state already and they ensure that um, items that used to go into the wrong system are now being taken care of in a more responsible manner. So for instance, we have a, um, 
gas canister uh, EPR program. And those used to be really dangerous in um, disposal facilities uh, because they would sometimes explode. And now because we have an EPR program for them, they are uh, disposed of in a much more safe manner. Um, so that's just one of the benefits of EPR. Um, next slide, please. So solutions so far that have come out of CFMM. Um, so Meriden was the first town to do a co-collection uh, food scrap pilot like you guys are about to participate in. Um, and they did that in spring of 2022. Uh, West Haven is piloting passive aeration composting. So they're trying out composting leaves and food scraps at their transfer station. Um, Fairfield is one town of a few in that area of the state that are um, recycling their glass separately from the rest of their recycling, which is really great because glass is one of our most contaminated uh, proven recyclable commodities because um, it's the last thing that's sorted out at the end of the sorting process. And so anything that isn't sorted out beforehand that's garbage that was contamination that wasn't supposed to go in the blue bin in the first place ends up in the glass. Um, so it's great to see that some towns in Connecticut are managing it separately because they get a cleaner product that is worth a lot more. Um, so Wilton is implementing a zero waste initiative in schools, uh, which is awesome. They're working on reusable trays, uh, food scrap collection, and sharing tables. Um, Public Act 2227 is that EPR program for gas cylinders I just talked about. Uh, and then you guys, Woodbury, right there, you guys are working on your co-collection program, which is coming up, so that's awesome. Um, and then we have Bright Feeds is a uh, food waste to animal feed uh, facility that opened up in Connecticut recently. And we also have Public Acts 2158, which updates Connecticut's bottle bill, which Cheryl will talk more about later. So this is the zero waste hierarchy. So before I showed you the um, solid waste management hierarchy, and that's sort of how um, we look at it from a management perspective. What are we gonna do with our waste once it's been produced and once it's gone through the system? Um, but this is a pre-system approach. So this is what you or I will do on an individual level um, when we have an item that we need to dispose of. So um, I like using an example of the note cards that I have. <laughs> as um, something that I would apply this zero waste hierarchy to. So um, <laughs> if I was looking to um, reduce my waste and I was, and I have this note card, um, the first thing that I could do is I could have, before creating the need for the note card, I could have tried a little longer to memorize what I was gonna say to you guys instead of needing the cues to remember. So that would be uh, refusing um, this item and not even creating the waste in the first place. Um, I can also reduce the number of note cards I use by using front and back. So that's something I've done. Um, I can also reuse the note cards, which I do at every one of these uh, presentations I give. I can also then repair the note cards if one of these rips, I could tape it back together. Um, I can repurpose them. So I've written most of them in pencil so I can erase and rewrite things that I need to as I go. Um, and if I wanted to, these are biodegradable, so I could throw them in a compost pile if I really wanted to, but I would probably actually put these in the recycling bin, um, because paper is recyclable and it is a valuable commodity. So that's sort of an example of how you can go through this zero waste hierarchy with whatever item you have to say, okay, how can I give this the highest possible, um, usage value? Um, and the higher you are on the list, the better you're doing, the more energy you're saving, um, so on and so forth. Next slide. So this is how we can form new habits with our waste. So we all think about waste um, generally, at least I think about waste as something that, you know, it's, just, it's gone when it's gone. I don't see it anymore. Um, it's out of my house, it's been taken to the curb. Um, but we need to start thinking about it in a way that um, leads us to form new habits where we don't see it as away and gone and out of existence because 
um, the snow card or the plastic bottles I use are still going to be there. They're just going to be recycled into something new or so on and so forth. Slide, please. So these are some ways that you can reduce your food waste. Uh, you can make a list before you go food shopping um, so that you make sure that you're sticking to only foods that you actually need to buy instead of just grabbing whatever seems good off the shelf. Um, I know I have done that in the past. Um, you can create a menu for a few days or a week in advance and maybe base your shopping list off of that. So you know exactly how much of the thing that you're buying you're going to need. Um, you can eat your leftovers. Uh, we can rotate food in our refrigerator and have older foods up front so that you don't have to sort of do the unload everything from the fridge to get to the stuff in the back, put the stuff in the back in the front so that it won't go bad and just sit there forever. Um, freeze items before they go bad. And then when you freeze items, mark what they are in the freezer before you put them in there because sometimes when things are frozen, you cannot tell what they are. So helpful to have it written on there with hopefully the date as well of when you put it in there so you're not taking it out and wondering, hmm, <laughs> wonder if this is still good to eat. Um, learning to compost or participate in community composting initiatives. So you guys have a great <laughs> one coming up. Um, good work. And the next slide. So we can also purchase to reduce or recycle. Um, so you can review the what's in, what's out list to ensure that you're not wish cycling items. So the what's in, what's out list you can find on the Recycle CT website as well as the Recycle CT Wizard app um, on your phone. Um, you can also purchase items with less packaging, and you can encourage your town to install the Recycle CT Wizard on your town webpage as well. Um, so what the Recycle CT Wizard uh, does is you can enter whatever item you are attempting to dispose of, and it can tell you exactly which waste stream to place that item in. Um, so it'll tell you whether something belongs in our blue bin recycling program or if it belongs in the garbage, um, among other waste streams that we have in the state. Um, and then you can also follow Recycle CT on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to post tips um, for how to recycle different things or how to dispose of them. You can also buy reusable and washable items. So you can get a reusable mug for your coffee every morning, um, a refillable water bottle. Um, silicone and beeswax wrappers are great as a replacement for um, aluminum foil and saran wrap. You can bring your own utensils um, and opt out when you're ordering takeout from the plastic utensils that they'll sometimes put in the bag. Because um, if you're ordering takeout and bringing it back to your house, you probably already have reusable utensils anyway. So um, it's good to eliminate that waste at the start. Uh, you can use cloth napkins, cloth hand towels in the kitchen, refillable coffee pods, cloth coffee filters, or a coffee press or a percolator. Um, and then if you are still, if you're living in a place where um, or living or working in a place where you often have birthday parties or just office parties for different occasions, you can create a party pack of reusable plates and um, dinnerware, utensils, uh, reusable napkins, stuff like that to reduce the waste that you produce at parties like that. Um, you can also reuse, share, and repair items. So buying more durable items is a great way to reduce the number of things that you're going to need. So um, if you're buying a pair of work boots or hiking boots, getting a pair that's going to last a while or a pair that you can uh, bring to a cobbler and have repaired um, is a great idea instead of just buying a whatever $10 pair is at the store. Um, donating unused items is a great way to ensure that they're going to have another life. Uh, donating responsibly, however, because um, it's not great to just donate garbage, stuff that can't actually be used anymore. Um, so donating unused items, but as long as they have some life left in them to be uh, uh, organized community events. My favorite of these is repair cafes. Um, repair cafes are basically events where people with uh, repairing skills will volunteer their time to help community members to repair their items. So 
I went to one in Cheshire last year and I can do some hand sewing. I'm not good with a machine, but um, I can do little hand sewing projects. And so I actually got to sew back together someone's family heirloom doll um, that their, I think, grandmother had made. And so they were passing it down to the next generation. And I got to fix it for them. It's awesome. Um, so repair cafes are great places to um, fix your items and pass them down. Uh, and then also Facebook groups like Buy Nothing pages, those are great. And then um, expanding your public library offerings. Um, I don't know how extensive your library is, but some libraries offer uh, toolkits. So if you want to fix your bicycle or um, need to fix something else in your house, they'll have kits that you can uh, rent out from the library in order to fix those things instead of having to buy tools if you don't have them already. And next slide. So moving on, uh, this is the a graph from the Connecticut Municipal Solid Waste Characterization Study that was performed in 2015. So this is basically showing what may what materials made up the garbage that we were throwing away um, in 2015. And so you can see the big categories are paper, plastic food waste, which is a big one because you guys are going to help to reduce that in your town this year. Um, other organics, uh, construction and demolition debris, and other waste. And there's a few other little ones in there, um, like metal, glass, fossil hazardous waste, and electronics. So what is recycling? Um, I think most of us think of recycling as um, all right, I have this item and I think that it is recyclable, so I'm going to put it in the blue bin and then it's going to be taken out to the curb and then dumped into the truck and it goes away and that's recycling. I did it, I recycled. Um, but recycling is a lot more than that. It is a cycle. Um, it's a whole system where materials move through. So the first step is collection at the curb. It goes into a garbage or a recycling truck. Um, and then next slide. And then it goes to a sorting and processing facility. So these facilities are called MERFs, Materials Recovery Facilities. Um, and so when it gets to the MERF, it is all the materials are just dumped on the floor and moved into a pile in the corner. Um, and then they are carted over to a conveyor belt and then they move up the conveyor belt and they'll start to be sorted. Um, and the first thing that happens when our materials are getting to be sorted is there's actually people who are the first line of defense. They're the first ones who are pulling out contamination and making sure that everything that's going into the system is something that belongs there. Um, so once it goes into the sorting system, uh, and actually once it comes out of the sorting system, it is the materials are baled. So they're made into um, fresh together blocks of material. Um, <laughs> something I thought of last night when we actually did another one of these presentations. It makes me think of um, the movie Wally, -E, where he just crushes all the material up and he makes it into a cube and then places it. Um, but this isn't like Wally -E because it's all recyclables and they're all going to go to a new place instead of sitting in a pile. Um, so then after they are bailed, uh, they are sold to an end market, so they're reclaimed. Um, so this right here, this is an example of plastic pellets. Um, so this is what our materials look like when they are um, prior to being shaped into a product that we would buy at the store. And so when they're sold, they are then made into a new product. And so what these plastic pellets would likely be made into is something like a milk jug. Um, and so after that new product is created from the raw materials that were resupplied, uh, we then buy the product with the recycled content. Um, and that is what finishes the cycle. So after we buy the products with recycled content, hopefully we'll sort them into the recycling bin again, and then they'll be taken to the curb, sorted, veiled, sold, made into a new product, and then we buy it again. So it's a cycle that goes through over and over again. So this is a very busy slide don't have to know all of this, but I want to point out um, that recycling is part of a much bigger 
system that we're trying to create to manage our waste and manage our natural resources. So recycling is right here, this big circle on the outside. So this just shows um, which steps um, our materials go through before they come back to be used by us. And it's much simpler in the next slide. Uh, and so this just shows what it takes for our materials to come back to us after we recycle them. So this sort of illustrates why the zero waste hierarchy is important um, because it shows that when we reuse materials, it only goes back one step in the system. Whereas when we recycle or when we dispose of our items, that's when we leave the system entirely. But when we recycle, they have to go through energy and material input again, um, production, distribution, and all of that costs energy and money to do. So it's best to stick to that hierarchy, next slide, and refuse, then reduce, then reuse, repair, repurpose, rot, and then recycle, and then dispose of if none of those other things are an option. And next slide. So we just talked about why we recycle. Um, so the next question is, how do we recycle? So um, we dispose of our items or recycle them in a lot of different ways. And those include all of these waste streams. So the first one is trash. And then we have our blue bin uh, program, which is what we're talking about today with mixed recyclables. Um, we have brush uh, streams, uh, textiles, electronics, plastic film, probably see that at your grocery stores, uh, collection bins. Um, there's food scrap programs, like what you guys are doing here in Woodbury. Um, there's also bulky waste collection programs, paint collection programs, and Oscar because that industry is great. Um, and if you could go back to the slide, sorry, it's okay. <laughs> um, all of these systems, all of these waste streams are important to think about because our materials might be acceptable in a textile recycling program or being donated to the well to be reused. But those textiles, even though they are recyclable, they're not acceptable in our mixed recycling move in system. And so, next. so this is what we're headed towards. This is what a modern collection of materials um, would hopefully look like. We would have our mixed recycling system um, where we put our plastic, our glass, our paper, and our metal. Um, and then we have our food scrap program um, where we would dispose of our organic materials. And then we would finally have our trash program. So you guys doing your pilot here, you guys are part of the future, part of our new system. So this is just coming back to our uh, municipal solid waste characterization study. So um, earlier I showed you guys the graph included what our uh, trash stream included. So the materials that we put out on the curb in our black trash bin, and this is what materials we are finding, we were finding in 2015 in our blue bin program, so our recycling curb program. So the majority of our materials are recyclable paper. Um, and it's great because paper is a great commodity. It sells very well. Um, so it's great to see that it's a big part of our uh, waste stream. Um, we also have, or our recycling stream, excuse me, uh, we also have aseptic or cart aseptic containers or cartons, plastic bottles, uh, other recyclable plastic, glass bottles, aluminum cans, steel cans, and the uh, the unfortunate piece of the pie, the red piece, which is our contaminants. So this study was done in 2015. So hopefully we've improved by now, and that red piece of the pie has shrunk. Um, but the contaminants consist of all of the items that we don't want in our recycling bin because they are bad for the sortation process or they just aren't acceptable in the blue bin program. So. 
mixed recycling. So uh, we used to have a dual stream system um, for our recycling, but uh, we have since moved to mixed recycling um, because haulers appreciated that it requires less time for collection and less equipment for collection and storage. So there's fewer uh, trucks out on the road picking up our materials um, than there were when we had dual stream. Um, but unfortunately, uh, mixed recycling due to that contamination, that red piece of the pie graph, uh, it typically lowers the value of our commodities um, and there is higher contamination, which is part of the reason that it costs more um, to recycle those materials. And so this is another busy graph that you don't need to know all of, but the thing to take away from it is that these blue bars, these shorter blue bars are with residuals, so with that contamination that I was talking about, and these orange bars are without residuals, so without contamination. And so what that is showing is that the uh, materials that don't have that contamination, those residuals, are around $10 more valuable per ton, um, which is a big deal because, next slide. Um, according to the 2015 Waste Characterization Study, uh, Connecticut MRFs processed 2 million tons of material, which when you factor the um, contamination into the value of that material, uh, adds up to um, $23 million in cost for that one year due to the contamination that was in our recycling system. Um, and that is where my portion of the presentation will pass. All right, well, thank you again for coming out on this lovely cold night. So um, I get to talk about some of the, the hard things. I get to talk about markets, which mostly is boring, I would imagine, for most of us. But really, I talk about markets because I want you to understand that these materials are commodities. The materials that come out of our MRFs, our materials recovery facilities, are bought and sold. It's a business. And back um, before the pandemic, we were being impacted by the inability to export our materials to China. You may have recalled some of the articles in the New York Times or other newspapers. And what was happening is our materials were so contaminated. And when I say we, I'm talking about our country, not just Connecticut. And um, in some places in the country, it was over 20, 22% contamination. So 18 looks pretty good, right? From 2015 perspective. However, what was happening is all of the materials, we were trying to sell them. And eventually they were just like, you know what? Your stuff is so contaminated. We only want 10% contamination in bales of paper, bales of fiber, bales of plastic. And then they put it down to 5%. Then they put it down to 1%, which made it really hard to sell because it's really hard to get down to so. It basically means if you have a big bale, four feet by four feet by four feet of cardboard, and there are two soda bottles in it, they could reject it. And so that was a challenge. And then we started creating new markets, Vietnam, Indonesia, and then COVID hit. And while COVID was really crappy for all of us, it was great for recycling markets. And that's because we needed so many things domestically. We needed more materials. We needed more paper towels. We needed more tissue paper. We needed toilet paper, all those things. And production started ramping up domestically. So they needed those raw commodities, which were fed by us because we were buying so much from Amazon and online. And so now the cardboard markets were skyrocketing. It was a lovely, lovely year in 2020 and 2021. And now, of course, in 2022, things changed and things haven't really shifted that much since then in terms of recession and a soft economy. Go ahead. So I'm just going to bore you with some numbers just to show you uh, that markets are real and that they fluctuate like anything else. Um, OCC is old corrugated cardboard. And um, as of at the end of January, it was $32.50 a ton. It was the same as December, and pretty much close to the same in November. Residential mixed paper always sort of lags behind cardboard, 
Um, so RMP is residential mixed paper. It tends to be sort of our junk mail and all the other mail that we have sort of mixed and combined. That was also um, the same as last month and it was a negative dollar and a half. So what that means, we, we have to pay for them to take it because there's excess supply. However, we're finding that um, while it's not 2019 prices, it is uh, probably the worst since 2020, since the pandemic. However, paper is still moving. Uh, plastic containers, a lot of people are always concerned about plastic and plastic has a lot of concerns to be. However, from a recycling standpoint, we only talk about containers because that's the only plastic that goes in your bin, right? It's your first clue, because I'm gonna give you a quiz later. So um, in terms of containers, natural high density polyethylene would be like a milk jug. Uh, that's went up 65.75 cents a pound, which may, may not sound like a lot, but it went up. Colored HDPE or high density polyethylene would be like a uh, laundry jug, um, about the same as last month. Polyethylene triethylate, that would be like a soda bottle or a water bottle that also went up. Um, and then polypropylene um, is a material that wasn't traditionally used for our food packaging, but it tends to be used more and more. And that's been um, pretty steady and going up and that's um, averaging at 5.5 cents per pound. So why you're really here, of course, is you're trying to understand, are we doing it wrong? That's what most people wanna know. How can I ensure that I'm doing it right? And I think if we take a step back, one, I don't wanna guilt, there's no shame. We all learn things. I learn things through the process. Um, I talk to MRF operators all the time and I'm always like, what? That is not in, what? Um, so it's a process. And if you learn something tonight that's different than what you're doing, um, it just gives you an opportunity to change and improve. It's also not completely our fault. Another busy slide. This is from the USDA, the Economic Research Service. They track new food products that are put on our retail shelves every year. And they are showing that 10 to 15,000, maybe even up to 20,000 new products are put on our retail shelves every year. So imagine 20,000 new products on our shelves every year. Do you think they're telling me what kind of packaging they're gonna use? Do you think they're talking to our MRF operators to see whether or not they can process that material? Are they talking to the end markets to see if anybody wants to buy that material? There's a huge disconnect in our system and that's part of the problem. Next slide, please. Another problem is the recycling arrows. I'm just gonna assume that we're all of a certain age. Well, maybe not Emma and Christine, but um, you're, how many folks are relying on the arrows and using the arrows to guide you? Yeah, well, and that's because in the 1990s, when we really started going with recycling programs, we relied on the arrows to tell us what kind of plastic it is. Well, now plastic is everywhere. It's not just about bottles. It's, it's so many different things. And this program is only about containers. It's about jugs, tubs, bottles, jars, berry containers, egg cartons. That's pretty much it. So if you recall the dual system where we put our bottles and cans in one and our paper in the other, the mixed recycling program just combines it. It doesn't add new materials. We were sort of missed, we, 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 we've heard that you can put anything in, but that's not the case. And if it has arrows and a number, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do whether or not it's acceptable in the program. It's about whether or not it's a jug, tub, jar, bottle. Make me go through it again. So next slide, please. And who knew that recycling was the law? This is your first quiz. I'm gonna ask by a show of hands if you think a law was passed in 75, 89, or 2012. Who thinks the law was passed in 1975 mandating recycling? Who thinks the law was passed in 1989 mandating recycling? And who thinks it was passed in 2012? And some people are refusing to answer. I just wanna point that out to the camera. 
So the law was passed in 1989, and it's a trick question because a second law was passed in 2012, adding to the list of mandatory materials. And so um, basically, Connecticut is very much a leader in this area. You hear, oh, back a little bit. So you hear a lot about California, Seattle, Portland. They're now mandating businesses recycle. Aren't they good back, you know, we're in the 2020s. You guys passed, I'm not originally from Connecticut, but Connecticut passed its original law in 1989. That is amazing. Okay, now we can go. So this is the list of all the mandatory material. If you don't generate it, you don't have to collect it. I don't generate a lot of motor oil, for example. Next slide. Everything above the blue line is what should go in your recycling bin, in the blue bin. Glass, metal, food and beverage containers, plastic containers, plastic containers. And yes, it says PET and it has the number. And that's because that was written when? In 1989. That was before we had all these other materials that have numbers and arrows on them. Corrugated cardboard, box board, that would be like a cereal box, newspaper, magazines. And again, you can see it's dated. It calls it white and colored office paper. You know, we just call it junk mail now. Anything that comes in the mail. Go ahead, next one, please. So I'm gonna give an overview of the bottle bill program just because there's been a lot of changes lately and I thought you might like to know. So you probably know that the law passed originally in 78 um, and it was implemented in 1980. I think Connecticut was the second state in the country. Um, it's an, it's a original intent was because of litter. It was really trying to put a deposit or value on that material so people would stop throwing it by the roadsides. Next slide. It primarily, it focused on uh, carbonated beverages. And so it was beer, soft drinks. And then in 2009, the bottle bill changed and it added water bottles. And then in 2021, it added all these other materials, hard seltzer, hard cider, plant water, juice, juice drink, tea, coffee, kombucha, plant infused drink, I don't know what that means, sports drink or energy drink. And it became an effect January 1st of this year. So if you're noticing sometimes when you go grocery shopping, it's a little bit more expensive. While we do have food prices that have gone up, you might also find that you're buying things that now have a deposit on them. Some of those cans may be charging you a nickel and it might not have the stamp on it. You can still return it for a nickel. There have been a couple of companies that needed, um, they were just slow in the process of getting their cans stamped. So we've got this like sort of transition period. So just be aware, anything you're buying as of January 1st, you'll get your nickel back. And then next year, it's gonna go up to a dime. Why they transitioned it that way, I have no idea, but it's quite interesting. So next year in January, it will go up to 10 cents. Next. And then there's another uh, bill that passed, Public Act 2158, about miniature liquor bottles. And um, this is a fee program. It is not part of the bottle bill. Basically, the wine and spirit wholesalers said, we want to have a fee on those miniature liquor bottles. And then we in turn are gonna give that fee that we collected back to municipalities. And so that's what they're doing. They collect um, and they record all the nickels that are collected for all the different miniature uh, liquor bottles that are purchased in Woodbury or Vernon or New Haven. And then the, every six months they tally it up and they give the nickels back to the town. And the intention is that they use that money for maybe litter abatement or cleanup programs or recycling programs. And some towns, I think, I think it was like Goshen, I don't know, I think they earned $39 I can tell you New Haven, where I'm from, it was a lot of money. So I don't know how much Woodbury is getting every six months, but if you have a volunteer committee or a recycling committee, I'm sure you have great ideas of how you might use that, that, that money. Next slide, please. And then Emma mentioned we have EPR programs and um, the EPR programs are great. They basically 
basically there are laws that are passed that mandate manufacturers who make this product have to create a program for us so that we can recycle it at no cost. We have electronics, paint, mattresses, thermostats. And as she said, we have a new gas cylinder program that's in, being implemented. And then we have this education program. We created an education program in partnership with the Recycle CT Foundation called What's In, What's Out. We created a universal list. So we all have one list across the state. And we have the Recycle CT Wizard, which is an online search tool, as well as the app, which um, Barbara, I don't know if Barbara's still here. Um, next slide, please. And then of course, you've already heard this, that we have other programs. Not everything goes in the blue bin. There are other ways in which we can use, uh, dispose of these materials properly or recycle. We have household hazardous waste days, textiles, food scraps. You have a Lions Club perhaps in town where you can bring your glasses. Books often go to the library. Do you have a swap shop in Woodbury at your town transfer station? You do, yeah. So you have household goods, et cetera. Next slide. So the way we've created the universal list is um, working with all the MRF operators that process all our mixed recyclables. We wanted to have an understanding of what are the materials that they really want? What are the materials they can sell? And what are the materials causing them problems? So we asked them these questions. Is, does this item cause problems to your staff? Emma mentioned that what happens is all the materials go through the MRF, they go up a conveyor belt, and the first line of defense is people. And they're picking things out. So when things come down on the line, what are things that are hazardous or things that you are concerned with that would cause safety issues? And if they cause safety issues or cause potential harm, they get taken out of the recycling stream. Can it shut down equipment? Tangle up the equipment? Then we took it off the list. Does it reduce the value of the commodities? Knowing what our mandatory materials are, sometimes they will accept more than what is mandated, but at the same time, there were certain things that were sort of just entered the stream because people just assumed you could put them in there and they were reducing the value of their other commodities that was taken off the list. Our number one contaminant is plastic bags and bagged material. So out of that 18.2%, about half of that was bags and bagged material. Next slide. So who can tell me, is your next quiz, who can tell me which is the bag of recyclables and which is the bag of trash? It's a trick, it's the same exact photo. And that's because when it's coming down the line, the guys don't have time. You know, it's coming at a pretty good pace. They can't like go, ooh, dirty diapers versus, oh, somebody really rids their recyclables so beautifully. They don't have time to open the bags. So they all get tossed as trash. So please don't bag your materials. If you bag your materials, it's gonna be thrown away. Next. So other contaminants besides plastic bags, Shredded paper is a problem. Air quality issues in the facility. Bagged recyclables, tanglers, things that tangle the equipment. That's like garden hoses, hangers, wire, clothing, bottle caps, small little things contaminate the glass. So this may be hard to see, but um, this is part of MRF machinery and we're looking down at it. You can't quite tell, but if you saw it sideways, you would see it was at an angle. And what happens is the materials come through and then they go up it. And it's like a, like a rod with little knives. So I guess it's going this way because what it's doing is it's pushing things up. And I don't know how it works, but it miraculously separates certain materials from certain materials, but it can't work if the knives are all tangled up with other things. And so this is an example, you can see the metal. This is an example of something that doesn't have any tanglers on it. Next slide. This is a picture of a Connecticut MRF in 2015. And you can't even see the knives because this is all plastic film. 
This is all plastic film. And this is a man. Because what has to happen is the machinery gets so tangled, and this is at all of our facilities, they have to stop the line and people have to jump in and manually cut all the plastic off. Talk about a safety concern. Next slide. And this is all the crap he cut off while I was standing there for 10 minutes. It's a lot of stuff. So what it tells us is we can do better. We can do better. Uh, did I mention not to cut your recyclables? I'm gonna hit you hard with it. Okay, next slide. So um, you've seen the slide before. What is recycling? Well, it's the same as why does quality matter? Quality matters because we're at the front end. We're the ones that puts all that material in the blue bin. And when we can reduce the contamination and make sure we're not putting the wrong thing in, it's gonna be easier for them to process and sort. They're gonna be able to meet this, the specification. And when they can meet the specification of what the end market wants, they're gonna be able to sell it. And then it's gonna be made into a new product, which we can purchase and then the cycle is complete. And sometimes we just, um, I, you know, I think Emma mentioned wish cycling. We just have to break some myths. First, all pizza boxes are in. Even dirty, I'm here to break the myth. So no food and no liners. You've got to eat your crust. Did I mention I was from New Haven? You've got to eat your crust. However, grease doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It, you can put the top and the bottom. It goes into your mixed recycling bin. And then no loose bottle cap out. Out is coffee pods, out is shredded paper, out is plastic bags. No polystyrene, which you might refer to as styrofoam. No styrofoam. No black plastic containers. Next slide. Uh, and some things are just trash. Coffee cups, lids, trash. Single use straws, trash, moldy textiles, trash. Use pens, pencils, toothbrushes, use broken garden hoses, use pop balloons, use styrofoam, insulating foam, just trash, goes in the trash. This is glass at the MRF. I think Emma mentioned that, you know, the small stuff contaminates the glass and that's because they are at the end of the line. And the end of the line is like a large grid and that grid has smaller holes and anything small enough can fit right through and it just contaminates it. Next slide. So this is what's in our glass. Tampon applicators, toothbrushes, prescription bottles, razors, toothpaste, lip balm, pens, batteries, bottle caps. You can probably see other things in there too that we didn't label. So we need to just stop the wish cycling. Again, gives us an opportunity to do better. And the MRF operators always uh, remind me other things, which might seem obvious, but believe it or not, they get these in the facility. No batteries, no syringes. Um, some of the MRF operators might have one stick a week. Uh, no propane tanks, believe it or not, no ammunition. If you got your ammunition, don't put it in your recycling bin. They do get a lot of lawnmower blades in the summer for some reason. No knives or other utensils. And I'm not just talking plastic. We don't want your plastic utensils either, but a lot of people will put metal utensils and that is a huge safety issue. Um, not only can it hurt staff, it can jam up the equipment, uh, no, no diapers, no tampons, things like that. So this is the RecycleCP.com uh, webpage. And if you hit slide it in the next slide, you can see this is the search tool. And I don't know if you have it on Woodbury's um, website. You do? Okay, so it's on Woodbury's site. And so what happens is when you type in a question about a material, um, it'll tell you if it's in or out, or it will suggest that you contact the town if it's a particular question like motor oil, because I'm not sure individually motor oil is sort of taken by town by town. And then if it doesn't, if your item is not in there, the app makes a suggestion to add it. And that goes to Emma and I, and then we're like, okay, we need to add it. It's a product we've never heard of. Let's research it. Let's learn more about it. Next slide. 
And of course, now we have it as an app as well. So you, you already downloaded it. Oh, right. Yay. <laughs> so it, the uh, Apple or Google Play, go ahead. And um, when you go to the web page, you can also download other materials. You have handouts that um, you picked up today. Say you wanted more or you wish you had brought one for somebody else. All of the materials can be downloaded and printed yourself, um, including other things such as bill inserts, if you want to send them out with tax bill or um, maybe postcards or whatever. We provide resources that can be used by individuals, municipalities, and haulers. Next slide. And if nothing else, if, if you don't remember anything else, especially with all those busy graphs, when you have an item, think about whether or not it's acceptable in the bin versus if it's recyclable. We have a lot of things that are recyclable, but not everything is accepted in this particular program because we have textile programs and we have wrap programs for plastic film and other programs. And so we just have to be, make sure that we understand that this is about bottles and cans and paper. Next slide. Oh, now it's the quiz. You ready? You look nervous. <laughs> That's right. Very nervous. I'll, I'll be easy on you though. I'm not sure if I can hold the microphone. Can you still hear me on it? Hopefully. You don't know. All right. So I'm going to start you off easy. In or out, pizza box. It is in. And does it matter if there's any grease in it? No. Does it matter if I do my truck? Yeah. The milk carton, in or out. It's in. Does it matter if there's a bottle cap on it? Yes. You can have a bottle cap on it. You just don't want loose cap. But if you remove it, that's okay too. <laughs> No, if you if you had it separate, the cap would go in the trash. Better off. It it could be. It means it won't get stuck in the system potentially. All right. Uh, this is a paper egg carton. Yeah. In. Yeah. Styrofoam milk uh, oh, egg carton. Yeah. Out. Milk jug. Yeah. Yeah. And the cap. Yeah. Attached. Garden hose. Why not? They get stuck. Right. All right. We're going to get harder now. You ready? All right. So this, do you think it's in or out? So these, uh, this is what I learned going through the list with the Merck operators. This is called a spiral wound container. Uh, and you can visualize it if I hold up the cinnamon roll pack, right? You crack it, it opens. So spiral wound containers are very problematic because they're made very differently. And this can tangle. It has metal, it has metal, it has fiber, it has plastic. What if you were to cut it? They don't want it because the inside of it is a problem too, apparently. The only one that's a little bit different, since I can tell you guys are uber recyclers, is that sometimes containers are like this and it's just literally plain cardboard. It's got a cardboard bottom. The only thing it's got a plastic lip, so I would rip off the plastic. But if that's too much to deal with, Put it in the trash. So the issue, the issue is the silver foil inside. Then on the it other? is. It's the exactly. Oh, okay. And sadly, it's a lot of containers. It would be like um, dried fruit, nuts. A lot of containers have these, and so sadly, all of them are out. Don't buy that. Or that's right. I think Emma talked about purchasing differently. You know, buy, try to buy in bulk or buy in a different way. However, then we have like, you know, kick bags. Are you sure? It's... All right, we'll compare it with an Amazon bag. Yeah, she's got it right. This is out of the blue bin system. 
However, you can mix it with other plastic film. So if you already bring like plastic bags and bubble wrap and stuff like that to the, to the store, they'll take this too. However, for these, you have to pull off the label. So somebody uh, last night was telling me that they just cut it out because they don't want to deal with it. Yep, this is all bubble wrap. So this is the same material, plastic film. Plastic film is stretchy, which is different than this. Crinkly. If you do that, it tears. Whereas this is stretchy. It's out anyway, though, right? It's out. However, it's part of the plastic wrap program if you're going to bring it back to a retail store. Some communities actually collect it at the transfer station or the community center, which you could do as well. Um, but at this, I think you probably only do it at your stores, right? Stop stop. That's right, stop and shop. That's right. All right, I'll give you another hard one. This is a um, moisturizer. Without the cover, without the foam? She's right. Yeah. 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 So this is in. You know, I just rinse it. If you look at mine, it's not so pretty inside. But I did rinse it. That's a question I have. It's like peanut butter. Oh my God! You're so hard to clean. That's why so, I have a dog. Suggest the spatula. Well, I do. I clean them out. I and that's fine. Them. Like, that's, how clean do they need? That sounds perfect. Okay. Spatula, a little shaking. I think the other ones that you you know a lot of things only need rinsing, okay. but like this one, I shook. A little bit. Yeah. A mayonnaise, I would shake. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I would use a little, you know, for pet food cans and tuna, but mostly that's the only stuff that's really oh, nasty. Yeah. I'm going to do two more things and then I'm, you'll be the first to have a question. Okay, so batteries. Um, it's like a battery dish. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's a different kind of a plastic, and they don't want it. It's like a bubble. I don't remember what they call it. It's like a hard bubble. All right, this is my last one, and then I'll get to your question. If I can open that. I want to know about those. Yeah. That. Yeah. We can just open. Oh, this? This yeah. is in. This is in. Okay. Aseptic? So, little miniature liquor bottle, spice jar, uh, vitamin. All about that, maybe? Another, another vitamin. Prescription bottles and where you are at. And spice the liquor bottle. I read somewhere that prescription drugs didn't. Right. So, do you remember why? Too small. Too small. So, all of this will contaminate the glass. So while a grate in a MRF facility is really large, a section of it would look like this with a two inch square. And so if it falls through, it's gonna contaminate the glass. Right. Oh, yeah. And then you get to the big one, right? Some of our vitamins are cheap. Yeah. That's okay. We have to cover without. Oh, the, that's fine. The cover is fine. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if you, you know, some people, Uber recyclers, they, they want the design, but don't feel like you have to. Think about it like a credit card. If it could fit in like a little credit card space. And again, if it's too much information, just say all pill bottles and prescription bottles and small liquor bottles are out. But why the cover is okay there with one with like the, the pump or with some of the other things that we said yes without well, lids, lids, lids and caps are okay if they're on. They oh, just can't be loose. Okay. Do you still remember your question? Yeah, uh, like uh, olive oil and have a metal thing. I tried taking it off, but sometimes it's very difficult to get the metal. You know, when you unscrew it with the metal cap on like an olive oil, there's a little piece of metal. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Mm
Remember foil around the tap of wine bottles. Foil around the wine bottles, that's fine. Around the, the capsule. Yep. Yeah. That's fine. You could take it off, but it's fine. I usually take it off because I like to drink it, you know. So. <laughs> Yes, in the back. It's in the trash. Yeah, it goes into the trash. So most of our materials uh, before summer of 2022 was incinerated. We don't have any landfills in Connecticut that takes and accepts municipal solid waste, meaning our waste. Might take commercial bulky materials, but none of our waste. So, so all of our stuff up until last summer was being burned, with a very small percentage going to out-of-state landfills. However, what you missed is that one of our facilities closed, and so that's why we're trying to um, be a little bit more innovative, progressive, try to figure out how to best recycle more, recover more materials, including the food scraps program in Woodbury. And so we do have a lot more materials going to out of state landfills. We still have our, um, our remaining four uh, incinerators, but um, at this point, we do also have a lot of materials that are going out of state. Why My guess is that your materials are probably incinerated. Why is that for clothes? That was one of the ones that Why was that? Um, yeah. Probably for a lot of different reasons. Um, I have never worked on that project, so I can't oh, okay. say for certain. We don't have plastic. Yeah, no, I think it was, um, it was, it probably depends on who you talk to, but there might have been some, yeah, I don't know. Maybe a general thing to say about that is that waste energy plants are very expensive to maintain, and they have a lifespan of about 30 years. That was waste has to be lifespan, oh, and the uh, yeah, the cost it would have taken to update all that pollution control technology was. And it was originally designed to be a coal burning, not a trash burning facility. Yeah. So they were dealing with astronomical maintenance issues and yeah. they decided yeah. they couldn't they couldn't afford the repairs. One of the things you've been trying to do is understand what recycling That's great. I'm gonna take a few more questions about recycling and then Christine can talk about the food scraps program. If you oh. wouldn't mind waiting. No, that's why I'm here. Okay. I'm about fast. Recycling. You said there's a program to do it, but I'm sure it doesn't happen at our transfer station. The only way I've ever been able to recycle, I mean, some things that are still good, I'll take the goodwill. But if it's, you know, like the cows and sheep that are old, right. the, the high school here does twice a year, they, they collect things like that. They have a, a vendor comes in and they get paid by the poundage for it. So if you're trying to get rid of that kind of thing, you should bag it up and save it and then donate it. It's usually announced in the news in the voice of the newspaper when it's always a Saturday from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. or something. Right. And you can drop off. So you do um, have a program. It's just not because I was gonna say usually it's goodwill, though sometimes yeah. it's a collection bit of the transfer station yeah. or the school. Right. So you have a program which does um a, Smaller failure, smaller community. Right. And they use they use the funds for their graduate the great for the graduate seniors part of it. Yeah. So if, if you have the space in your house to back up, you know, the ripped jeans and the old t-shirts and all that kind of stuff that can be if you can save them, you can save them wonderful. Sometimes veterinarians and uh yeah. pet clinics also yeah. take linen because they always yeah. need old towels. Yeah, so it's not about recycling, it's about whether or not it's acceptable in this program. So black plastic um, originally was accepted in the program, and that's because only a small percentage of the materials coming through were black plastic containers. And our MRF operators felt that they could handle the small quantities of materials that were coming through. With the pandemic, we all started doing takeout. 
And they were like, we're overwhelmed. We can't handle this much black plastic. And the reason being is the black plastic containers, the optical scanners do not read it and do not understand what it is. So sometimes it thinks it's paper, sometimes it thinks it's plastic, sometimes it thinks it's metal. And so it always puts it in the wrong place. Is there any movement to move towards what I do is tell your favorite restaurant do you prefer them to use white? They do have white. Um, I think there may be other colors as well, but in terms of like standard stock, I think they have other materials. Um, I was going to say something else about that and I forgot, but uh, yes. What about the lids? The lids are fine. That's fine as well. I love how you brought samples. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Well, as long as you're not giving away a truckload, it's fine. But you know, it's the same with paperback books. If you have a couple of paperback books, they can handle it. But um, they don't want boxes and boxes, especially since it's probably better to reuse if you can. Um, so I'll take one more question, and then we'll have Christine come up and talk about the food truck. Any other questions about recycling? All right, well, thank you so much. You're a great group.